So, Bruce, where were you born and bred? Uh, I was born in Wales, other side of the world, and then went to Scotland when I was a little boy, probably, probably about that big. And then came uh, to the North Island when I was about probably about that big with my parents. And, uh, Hang out the North Island of my parents, and I was about I was about 20 years old or so, and I got a one-way ferry ticket south. Sweet. Yeah. Actually, first time I came to the west coast, I climbed up, went up, didn't even make it to Westport, stop, went up the Hikanui River, climbed up to up to the peaks there, eh, and looked down, looked down across, and said, "Oh, there's a little town down there. I guess that's Westport." And she says on the map, "It's Westport." Yeah, that's, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. We kind of ended up there. And why, yeah, why, why did you choose the West Coast? Oh, I just love the West Coast, eh? It's pioneering stuff, you know, eh? It's, uh, it's sort of, uh, it's the last frontier, you can still do stuff, you know, you can uh, do whatever you want, timber milling or whatever, you know, it's all, all pretty rafting, hunting, fishing. Yeah, well, I, I started off uh, timber milling, you know, I built a mill there and uh, I milled wood, you know, big heaps of wood and clogged the wood off, that was me, that was my living, eh? A little bit of hunting and that, and then they, they got too many uh, laws about all of the wood and that, you know, do native timber and so on. And so I thought, oh, time to do something else. So I got to do a bit of white water rafting and then doing that for a wee while now. Because they, they actually yeah. banned timber milling in New Zealand, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, how, yeah. how long ago? That was about 15 years, 20 years ago now, wasn't it? Yeah, be good 20 years ago they quit that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah I so remember I, that, and it just, it, really, it just shut the west coast down, didn't yeah. it? Well, you still can kind of can do it, but there's too much paperwork, there's more, you know more paperwork than actually works, so it's the time for me to put on that, eh? Isn't it? And there's only yeah. existing blocks that, that people still had consent for before they yeah. put the ban out, is that, that that's correct, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, pretty much, yeah, and lots of paperwork to go with it. I'm not interested in the paperwork, I'm not office work, right? <laughs> and so ever since they changed, they shut the sawmilling down, there, there's been a, a wee bit of dairy dairy farm work on the coast, but really, what, the, what industry is there here in Westport? Well, is there anything? There's not much over the dairy. The dairy's not doing that good, and uh, the mining's all gone kaput. It's not doing real good at all. Uh, yeah, the tourism is about the last thing. I reckon they're still doing all right. You know, it, uh, yeah, I run a bit of rafting, me and the mate. You know, it's, it's been a real job, eh? <laughs> yeah, it yeah. certainly is. Oh, I concur. I concur. <laughs> yeah, tell us about so, your love of the sea. Yeah, yeah. It was, well, I've got this old boat, old fishing boat, 100 and it was built in 1912, so I guess that's 100 and something years old, about 105 years old, I suppose. And yeah, still going strong. And that, that was uh, the ex pilot, bluff pilot boat. It's been fishing in Fobo Strait down there for down near 100 years, so uh, yeah, it's a good trial for it. Uh, yeah, the so fishing here is kind of like pretty much nowhere else in the country, as it probably it might be able to just about see out there. Eh? Um, there's no shelter on the west coast anywhere. There's just, there's just isn't. You can go to Jackson's Bay all the way there, or you could go all the way back up around to Nelson, but pretty much for all the way down here, there's no shelter. So if you get caught out, you're, uh, you're kind of going to have a bit of a hard time. You either get try to get back in, into Greymouth, or you can try to get back into Westport, and if the bar's too rough, well, that's it. It's all over. you just got to hang out there and uh, kind of wait till it's all. So tell us about this house. You built this house from scratch, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I had no house at the time, so for our house was damn expensive, eh? So uh, it was best to uh, just mill one. So I had my mill there, so I've got a couple of few drums of diesel. A big, uh, this guy uh, had a swag of logs, so we, we milled all his logs up, and uh, it was his logs and my mill, so we went halves on the whole lot. And then that, yeah, just got stuck in building the house, see? How long ago was that? Oh, I've been here, must be about 17 years, I've been here now, 18 years. Maybe, no, maybe not, maybe about 20, I suppose. Yeah, about 20 years, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, tell it, what's, what have you got going on here, Bruce? Yeah, well, we're making a yurt. And so these are uh, the roof poles, they go up the, like that. And these ones over there, these are for making the walls. And they sort of, they go about like that, all crisscrossed. All the way around it, like yep, that, that makes sense, way, yep. All the way around, right around the wall. Chuck one on there like that, lots of crisscrosses, like that. Right around the outside wall. And they need to be bent and slightly out, don't they? Yeah, slightly bent, so they're kind of curving around, because the whole thing's round, so they, if they were straight, they'd be kind of cutting the corner, so they look at the bend and they... Well, yeah, How are you bending those suckers? Yeah, we've got a steamer out here. Come out and have a look, eh? Sweet. Pretty quiet, really. Yeah. On any surface. 
this used to be the roasting veranda. This is where I did the roasting, but it was totally open. There was no walls there, so it was just this open air veranda, and I had the roaster sitting over there. Now it's a junk room guest bedroom. I, I just realised that you fellas haven't actually met Tater. Uh, uh, who are who are you again? And how did you end up in New Zealand? I am Tater Coppernall. Uh, Tater's nickname because I came from Idaho, uh, which is famous for lots and lots of potatoes. My real name is Jerry Coppernall. And how did I come to New Zealand? It's, this character got me to New Zealand. I was happily teaching at Southern Oregon University and I decided to take my son rafting for his birthday. And so I hired Bruce to take us rafting up on the Upper K, which is quite a gnarly river. And uh, so we're going down the river and uh, he's yelling things at us. And I remember looking at Buck and saying, can you understand what he's saying? And he said, no, I don't know. I said, well, just keep paddling. So we did and then, but it was a lot of fun. And so afterwards, uh, we thought he's, he's, you know, he's, he's kind of fun. So let's invite him out to dinner with us. And so we did. And then, uh, you know how that goes. Uh, we hung around together and then, um, oh, a couple months later, I was at home with the table stacked with essays and stuff that I was grading. And he comes in and he says, Tater, why don't you come to me with me to New Zealand and live a life of romance and adventure? And I looked at all those essays and I said, well, that sounds good to me. <laughs> well, those are exact words, Bruce. Yeah, exact words. Exact yeah, pretty words. good line, eh? Yeah, it's only the one pinch that line. It's a good one. <laughs> the old romantic, eh? I yeah. thought he was a man of few words, too. Turns out he's actually got a few in his repertoire there. He must have been reading Reader's Digest. <laughs> the ship, ship pile of adventure. He's not a short adventure, right? Eh? Yeah, it's, it's, he, he wasn't lying. No, you we've know, been running off from avalanches, all kinds of crap. Oh, yeah, eh? yeah. Oh, that's right. You yeah. had half a mountainside almost yeah. fall on your right. lights, eh? Yeah, it was yeah. like Raiders of the Lion. Last Ark, man. Yeah. We were, it was, it was, uh, it was pretty exciting. What, what happened then? Could you, could you guys tell me what, what, where were you when that happened? What were you uh, doing? We were up right up in Baker Creek, right up high up in, and in the head of the lands, for a tar hunting, middle of winter. Right in the middle of the mountains, eh? Yeah, right in the middle of the mountains, and uh, you know, in the snow and ice and all that. And uh, so, anyway, it was too rainy a day for climbing up on the hills. It's you know, raining and storm, so we walked up the valley. And we're heading off up the valley. And there was this big bang crash, and uh, we were right on this alluvial we fan. We looked up, and oh shit! The whole mountain's coming down straight to us, big avalanche. And uh, so we scarped, run. We we went into the river. Actually, dived into the river behind a big rock, and we hunkered it behind there. And it rained down rocks, and some of the size were um, yeah, cars, some of the yeah. size of politicians, size of wheelbarrows, all kinds of different sized rocks. Some were as big as grapefruits, you know, the little wee ones. And uh, yeah, none of them seemed to hit us, and we, uh, yeah, then we did all right. It was, it was pretty exciting. Spooked us a bit. Yeah, well, it was pretty exciting, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was difficult that night, because uh, when it rains in these glacier valleys and everything thaws out, the ice has been in there doing its work, and then it thaws out and things just fall. And so all night long we could hear things falling. And cracking, eh? The sound yes. of the ice cracking and, and all cracking. the rest of it. And avalanches, big ice avalanches way off, but they sound like they're just, just around the corner. Then there's been the odd time we haven't got down out of the bluffs that night. Oh, uh, we yep, haven't quite yep. made it down, and we've had to sleep under tarskins and stuff. Yep, we know, slept under tarskins. Up one in the night. snow, so we weren't sure on an adventure, was it? Yeah, it, it was. That was the time he had to haul me up cliffs on the end of a rope, and uh, it got late, and we didn't want to go back down the cliffs on the end of the rope. That was Baker Creek too, was it? Was that the same block? No, that was uh, Able Lake. That's Able Lake. Steep up there, Able Lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so this is th this is tar hunting they're talking about. Me and Bruce love our tar hunting, as do a lot of other west coasters, because it's steep, it's dangerous, it's a, it's extreme, extremely steep. Bruce actually showed me where the half of the mountainside fell off. We went to the same place hunting, just me and Bruce, and uh, it's, uh, it's, they had a pretty close call, I think. It, we've all had pretty close calls. Uh, Smitty was telling us how shit scared he was once when we were up there, and yeah, it's never a dull moment up in the mountains, eh? Yeah, yeah that's for <laughs> sure. All right, so what were you showing us there, Tata? Uh, I'll show you um, what I do in my spare time. Okay, so this used to be the roasting well, the packing room, and now it's been turned into what it was designed for to begin with, and that's a, a, a weaving room. So this is what I've been working on recently. Oh, cool. And this is uh, actually, this loom is from Nelson. It was made in New Zealand by a retired American helicopter pilot. Is that, is that Jewish? It looks like some kind of Jewish thing. Um, 
I don't think so. Could be Jewish. Uh, a lot of these old patterns are either uh, real early American, like from the Appalachia area, or they're uh, Irish, um, German. Uh, certainly, they could be Jewish. And uh, how, how does it? Could you give us a little five-second demonstration? Sure. It looks quite complicated. Sure. Um, the most complicated thing about it is uh, is when you warp the loom. All of these threads have to go. In, in the, there's a little hole in here. Oh, three more through, I see, and, yep. And I they've, see. Got to, they've got to go in in a certain sequence. Okay. Because that's what helps to determine the pattern. So that's called the warping the loom. And then once you get that done, then you've got the treadles down under here where my feet are. You just work those for me. See? I see. And, and that moves that, the lambs, and that does that. And that's what makes what's called a shed. And so this is where you're the shuttle goes through is in this area here and that's called the shed and so to do the pattern it's a combination of having the threads go in the right sequence in the different frames in this case four of them and pushing down the right treadles at the, you know in the sequence so you've got the, a pattern this is you know what it looks like um, I actually tuned out about two minutes ago and started thinking about sheds. <laughs> Bruce has got, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure some of you folks out there are very interested in the loom. However, I'm more interested in seeing Bruce's shed. Do you have any finished products we can see? Um, I actually, I've give, I've got some placemats, but they're kind of small. Otherwise, I've given everything away. Oh wow, that's I, nice. I do it a lot as presents, so that'll be done in a couple of weeks. And this is where your, because last time I saw this room, it was full of coffee roasting, yep. packing stuff, wasn't yep. it? Yeah, we had counters in here, and all the coffee was in here, and I did all my packing in here. But the reason we're not in here anymore is because every time I go home to visit relatives in the States, Bruce would have to do all the packing, and he would go, oh, this is way too slow. And so he would invent new ways of packing coffee. And so the last time he invented a new way of packing coffee, it wouldn't fit in this shed. Oh. So he had this old garage shed down there, and now it's mine, and it's all fancy and fixed up. So I'll show you the uh, the new invention that Bruce did. Let's go check out some more sheds. I just gotta grab my glasses. I'll let Buck operate it. He's good at showing people how that works. Um, so this is, this is the home, the home of Kawateri Coffee. Arguably the best coffee in New Zealand. I think it's the best, these guys think it's the best. And I'm sure if you try it, you'd think it's the best as well. And Tata, well actually her son Buck now does everything. She's, she's, she's brought her, her family and bringing the slaves to hide help right. to, to run the business because she's getting rushed off her feet and she realized, hey, life is too short to make coffee all the time because the more you make coffee the less time you get to drink it so she's got Buck in here and Buck is now taking the reins and he's running the whole operation now it's pretty pretty technical look at that she even got a computer and some and a chair and stuff and oh Jesus I'm smashing the tripod around there all right let's get a shot of the coffee when I came over to Westport the first time I got here and realized there was no coffee in town except instant coffee so wait wait but Bloody hell, the hide helps making a racket. <laughs> I, so I don't, it's my fault because I don't have microphones yet. I, I didn't have time to mic everyone up and I don't even have mics to mic everyone up. So even if I had them, it wouldn't matter. Boy, you were so rudely interrupted. There, oh, this is here, there's the interrupter. Say hi. Yeah, hey, how, and, and how did you end up in New Zealand? I uh, came over on holiday and stayed. How long ago was that? 15 years? No, Bloody hell. Yeah. 17 years. No, it's 15 now. Is it? Is yeah, it? November 9th. Ah, okay. So, yeah, I came over on a 21-day holiday and got my residency, just kind of a fluke, and I uh, got a job on the movies with Bruce's uh, brother, which is my step-uncle, and ended up working on King Kong and mucking around over at uh, Peter Jackson's place, and yeah, now I roast coffee. Doing about the whole bean and ground right now. Yep. So I'll just kind of keep the traction up. What are these? And what? Pour over. Show me a picture. Makes a single cup of coffee. Well, you can make 
quite a big cup of coffee. And there's a cholesterol advantage to drinking these? Or? Absolutely, because the cholesterol, the sludge in the bottom of the plunger pot, uh, actually increases your bad cholesterol. That's according to um, Willett from uh, some big university. Anyway, it's well known. Uh, so it's a fact. It's a medical fact. It does do that. Really and Harvard Institute of Medical Harvard Science. Institute of Medical Science, of course. There you go. And um, anyway, the paper filters, not the brass, not the silver, but the paper filters take out that um, uh, cholesterol rising sludge in the bottom of the coffee. And only the paper filters do it, apparently. And so that's what this does. So, so there you go. If you are a coffee drinker and you drink a lot of coffee, this is almost a must-have. One of these pour-over things with a paper filter. And we are the only ones in New Zealand to stock them. How's that? And you can get yes. them from Kawateri Coffee. Which there'll be a link under this video. More noise pollution. It's hard to find good help, isn't it? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> we'll let the man work in peace, shall we? Yes. <laughs> All right. So, if you would like one of these pour over filter things, you can order them from Kawateri Coffee. Jump on their website. Uh, Kawateri.coffee. Kawateri.coffee. Easy. Yep. But yeah, there'll be a link to that under this video. And you can buy one of these and have less of the bad cholesterol. Because good cholesterol is good, isn't it? That's right. And bad cholesterol is bad. I don't Very know bad. much about that stuff, but I do know that I bloody love coffee. So I'm sold. I'm going to start drinking out of this instead of just pouring it into the pot in the bush and stirring it with a stick like I usually do. I'll still do that, but I will filter it through one of these things from here on in. Calitary Coffee, we roast only certified organic, registered fair trade coffee. And you can see this one here, that's the green bean right there. This one is an Ethiopian coffee from the district of Hara. So that is our uh, Okari Dark, if you would. That's our single origin. So if you want a nice, rich, heavy coffee, that's from the Hara district right there. There you go. And I can show you the finished product if you'd like. And the coffee plant is actually a cherry. It grows in a little cherry and they're quite tasty. They're quite delicious. It tastes very similar to a cherry, actually. I've coffee plant in my house. Oh, have you? This is the Paparoa Thunder. Oh yeah, single origins are like, they're the thing. Uh, you know, blends are kind of passe. It's, it's in. If you want to be cool, you should drink single origin coffee. Yeah. I don't know why, but you just should. If you, I guess if you live up in Auckland and you, oh, my coffee's from Blooming Ethiopia, and well, mine's actually from Westport. Well, no, it's not because they import their coffee from overseas. Uh, yeah. There you, want, you go. Do you want to see a picture of my coffee tree? <laughs> I do. Let's Come go, on. Go check it out. <laughs> Actually, when I was down in uh, Mexico uh -huh. filming for the one of the, the Discovery Channel programs, we used to sneak down to the coffee plantation at night and steal their coffee beans to eat. It's been doing really good inside so far. Um, needs a little bit of water now, it looks like. Uh, I'm afraid to put it right directly in the sun. I think it would be too hot for it because this is uh, an Arabica. Um, they're normally grown under shade trees. Dark roasted, tiny little beans. Do my deliveries. Oh, it smells good, doesn't it? Yeah, I reckon. 